Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Loki Season 2, Episode 1. Loki has been one of my favorite MCU titles ever, and so far Season 2 is building on the high concept humor and marvelous mystery, even without an appearance from... <laughs> Not today, miss! In case you don't remember my breakdowns of Loki season one, when it comes to the show, I hold nothing back. I literally go frame by frame, not just to point out Marvel Easter eggs, but to like illuminate the attention to detail, to decipher all visible text on screens hidden by designers like folks from Cantina Creative, who I have interviewed to try to make myself an expert on where and how they hide stuff. And sometimes I even illustrate abstract time travel concepts and theoretical physics. To connect these, you would have to kind of bend three dimensional space on itself. So when it comes to Loki, you're in the right place, folks. I'm so glad to be back with you to experience this amazing show every week. Let's go! We open with the Marvel Studios title card. Now, there have been several updates from throughout Phase 4, like the sides of the R have Jane Foster, Thor, and Moon Knight, She-Hulk, Thunderclaps from the side of the A. He remains from the Loki Season 1 finale, when Loki and Sylvie first step into his office from the elevator, he appears at the top of the A, because he dominates the Avengers. But the latest edition, that only has shown up now, on the leg of the R, hey y'all, it's Miss Minutes! This is a moment when she was flipping through the fake TVA records on a fake TVA spacecraft that would fly through the void to stall Sylvie, and it was one of the only moments Miss Minutes and Renslayer ever worked together in cahoots quite like this, at least so far. And yes, on the main Marvel Studios title, you see Kamala Khan appearing in the R, and then Shuri from Black Panther Wakanda Forever appearing in the V. And yes, this whole title is colored green and gold, which are Loki's colors. Okay, we open on the eyes of the statue of a Kang variant, he who remains, towering over the TVA, just as another statue did in the final shots of season one, after Loki was pushed by Sylvie through a time door from He Who Remains Citadel at the end of time back into the TVA. Now it's worth noting that this He Who Remains statue is not the one Loki ended on in the first season. That was back in the TVA archives section. This is in the main part of the TVA from the legal courtroom level. But starting with He Who Remains Eyes puts us in an apprehensive state. Like whatever we do, some version of Kang is out there always watching us. Actually in various shots of this background, several of these statues are scattered across this vast interior looking out in all different directions. So we see Loki sprinting from Mobius and the other hunters, and his head perfectly aligns with the statue of He Remains in the background, which is a clever little way of showing how Loki considers it his responsibility to rule the TVA and He Remains dead. Meanwhile, Mobius and the hunter's heads don't align quite as well. And it's just so sad to see Loki in slow motion turn back to look into the eyes of Mobius, his friend, and realize that this past version of Mobius has no idea who he is. The last time Loki and Mobius were on this walkway actually was when they really didn't know who each other were, back in the very first episode of the series after Mobius took Loki out of the courtroom. And back then, it was a dark TVA background. Here, there is some light in the distance, as we are seeing the TVA in an earlier past era, when He Remains still ruled it somewhat transparently, before he wiped everyone's minds and began hiding behind the timekeepers. Mobius and B-15 do not know who Loki is, as this would be before he ever met them. But the confusing part of this is, when Loki approached this past Mobius and this past B-15, they were talking about this. That's what, 63 new branches in this unit alone? Does he want us to just let them all branch? Well, at this point, how are we even going to stop it? So those 63 branches must not be referring to Sylvie rupturing the sacred timeline in the present, as we did see Mobius and B-15 reacting to that moments earlier in the present day TVA, a moment that we actually see in these opening minutes here in the present. But rather, those 63 branches that they were talking about in the archive must be referring to some other past incident in the past TVA, where the sacred timeline also really got out of control at some point. So when Sylvie pushed Loki through that time door from the Citadel, he was going to a past TVA where the sacred timeline had also reached some critical state for some reason. He time slipped, and neither he nor we, the viewers, saw it or realized it. His temporal aura must have cross-wired with his past and present self. So how many times has the TVA reached this critical mass in its history? What was the past incident with the 63 branches that Mobius and B-15 were fretting about in the archives? It could just be that the TVA's temporal loom reaching a critical mass is a destined cyclical event, something that happens again and again and again, a kind of apocalyptic Ragnarok that every Every era of the TVA inevitably goes through, kind of like a bubble of a market bursting. I mean, hey, they must have designed those blast doors on the Loom observation deck for a reason, right? So in the scene, Loki sees one of those yellow mail trucks flying past. We actually saw these in the wide shot of episode one of the series. Loki jumps off the ledge and he falls past this orange billboard that reads Timeline Preservation Administration and lands in the mail truck numbered 435. It's kind of like Lilu landing in Corbin Dallas's taxi in the fifth element. We see a few boxes flying out and you know there's some future TVA employee who's like, 
okay, you know, I never got my package. This mail truck flies past a few other interesting signs, coercive conversation center and variant affairs. And then from the mail truck driver's rearview mirror hangs a missed minute ornament. This driver panics and clips the cheek of the he remains statue, causing it to crumble. And we stay on this crumbling for a bit as if to suggest, hey, you know, he who remains is capable of crumbling and disintegrating. He is mortal. For what it's worth, most of the Kang variants we see in the Quantumania post credit scene also had scars and missing body parts and various augmentations. Eugene Cordero returns as Casey buffing the floor. Now, you know this is an earlier era of Casey because his breast pocket does not have the ink stains that he typically always has. In season one, Casey said that he had spent his whole life behind that desk. So the fact that he's a janitor now tells us that this was from some past era before his memory was reset. When the mail truck crashes, we see it has a Miss Minutes bumper sticker reading, how's my driving? Report me to. It's not even called this number. It's straight up report me to. The round orange chrono monitor screen has an older era interface to show the sacred timeline like it's blockier and staggered in a kind of a stair step look to it as opposed to the smooth curved line of the present era, which might remind you of like early, early computers before Steve Jobs insisted on adding all this extra memory so that like the corners of his windows could be curved. Casey removes his headphones and listen closely. Your mind and relax. Yeah, it's some guided meditation recording, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is the voice of Tara Strong, who also voices Miss Minutes. The mail truck teeters out the window. <laughs> Should be fine. Yeah, we hear a thud, but you know, we also do see that mail truck smoking as it zigzags away. So maybe she is okay. The screen falls and cracks the floor emblem of the TVA. We see the hourglass logo and it's pierced by a sword. Because it's not just about time, these guys are slashing and burning timelines to maintain the order. There is a significantly long take of Loki appealing to Casey as directors Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson use a handheld camera to whip back and forth between Loki and Casey. Just an interesting camera style that they're gonna use throughout the episode. And what I love most about about it is that it proves they are shooting these moments on practical sets that they actually built. Whereas so much of what we see on Disney Plus is shot on the volume. Here they just keyed stuff in on a blue screen behind these sets. Loki experiences what we later learn is called time slipping, which has a sickening visual to it. Like Tom Hiddleston's face and his limbs contort and stretch from each other, looking like bubblegum. It's just a very cool way of showing a person becoming unstuck from time, to borrow Kurt Vonnegut's term for consciousness-based time travel in the novel Slaughterhouse-Five. So time slipping is a type of time travel that I've defined in the past as vertical time travel, in which a character slides forwards or backwards within their own timeline. This is not to be confused with what I've called glitching or lateral time travel, in which you hop across different timelines or universes within a multiverse. Loki is doing what Doctor Strange does or Thanos does when they use the smoother, more intentional form of time slipping using the time stone, or what Kamala Khan does when she opens the bangle to tear a hole in space time and go back to the 1940s. But the other kind of time travel, what I've called lateral time travel, is more of like multiverse hopping. It's what Miles Morales does when he glitches in the animated Spider-Verse movies, or what Wanda Maximoff does when she dreamwalks in Multiverse of Madness. So Loki has now time slipped into the present, where the windows of this room are covered, which means that they might still be under repair from that mail truck crash that has now been written into the past. Casey now has the pens and ink stains in his front pocket, and the floor crack is now there. Has it always been there? The crack? It's been there as long as I can remember. So to be clear, that crack was not on the floor emblem when we saw it back in Loki season one. So Loki really has altered history here. This idea of the past being rewritten in real time is a time travel convention that we've seen in titles like Back to the Future, the movie Frequency, Butterfly Effect. But for the Loki series, it establishes that the TVA is on its own timeline axis with cause and effect. In season one, Mobius told Loki that time passes differently here in the TVA. And in the comics, the TVA is in a dimension called the Null Time Zone. So we've been assuming that this facility is kind of like time in independent, or frozen in time, but no, 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 no. Things do happen and marks are made. We see Casey is holding this orange book. This is actually the TVA guidebook that we see in the closing credit montage that OB references later. It's in the TVA guidebook? The what? There's one on every desk at the TVA? Yeah, he says it's a detailed index of every mechanical classification and maintenance routine in each sector, on each device, and inside every computer program at the TVA. And OB says he wrote it himself. Since Casey had to sit at his desk for most of his history, he might have been the only employee to read it other than OB. I think it's gonna be a pretty important book to keep an eye on in the future. Okay, the white on black title with the flickering typefaces returns. This was designed by the Perception Design Lab, who said that they used the fonts of the titles from every MCU movie 
Loki has appeared in, so that would include the three Thor films, Avengers 2012 and Avengers Infinity War. Some of the typefaces are Norse runes. At one point we see an O with little horns on it. Despite the changing text, the color is uniform to show that despite all these variations, we're still looking at a Loki. So back in the TVA present, present Mobius and present B-15 are still in that main chronomonitor bay reacting to the aftermath of Sylvie's decision. B-15 wants to tell everyone in the TVA that they're variants, but Mobius is wary. Hey. Everything you've been doing is wrong, and all your gods are dead. Since Loki and Sylvie came into this as gods, or demigods, the delusionment of gods and faith has really been the core to this series. Since Loki worshipped himself, his god died in the very first episode, Glorious Purpose, as he has had to come to terms with the fact that everything he had been doing was wrong. Mobius realizes Miss Minutes is offline. Now, we last saw her in the season one finale in the Citadel, also when she was sandbagging Renslayer for TVA records. We know from trailer footage a version of her will show up in 1893 Chicago. We meet Hunter X-5 played by Raphael Casal, who we know from preseason reports and trailer footage will also be playing the movie star Brad Wolf at the Zaniac premiere in a future episode. But here, we see he's also a TVA hunter, and he's kind of a jerk. He mocks Mobius' love of jet skis from that Wake magazine that was on Mobius' desk in season one. Jet skis. Sea dues. You know, the funny thing about jet skis, everyone thinks that it's a personal watercraft and it's actually a brand, same way Kleenex is. He's right! And I only know this because in journalism school, this was drilled into us from the AP Style Guide, and this always capitalized rule also applies to Velcro. And previously it applied to dumpster, though that was updated to a common term that you're allowed to decapitalize back in 2014. X5 reports. With Renslayer missing, there's a new judges council. So General Docs and Judge Gamble would like to see you both in the war room. Now, we will meet these two shortly, but General Dox is played by Kate Dickey, Liza Aaron from Game of Thrones, and was also a First Order officer in The Last Jedi. Her name, Dox, D-O-X, might come from Mr. Paradox, a TVA judge from the comics who judged She-Hulk for the crime of warning Hawkeye of his impending death. Mobius M. Mobius and Mr. Ouroboros, who's a clone of Mr. Paradox in the comics, show up in this issue as well. But the name Dox could also be a nod to the internet slang of doxing, i.e. outing the personal information of a private individual to get them in trouble. Now, I wouldn't call what General Dox is doing now to be doxing, but something closer to like blocking or deplatforming. But hey, maybe she got those pass medals for exposing anonymous variants. Judge Gamble is played by Liz Carr, and she might have gotten her name from the TVA member Justin Alphonse Gamble in the comics, who believed the TVA needed to move against robots called the Dreadlocks, and eventually he wrote a Broadway play called The Day of the Dreadlocks, which kind of seems like what X5, aka Brad Wolf, is gonna do in his sacred timeline dream life. Now, in this elevator and in the war room, X5 stands with his hands on his chest plate, making X and 5 super visible like some dumbass who tattoos one word across his knuckles, and X5 kind of looks like XS, as in, yeah, this is excessive. In later shots, you can actually see scars on each of his forearms that line up perfectly with a scratch across his chest plate, which tells me that, like, something might have cut him while he stayed in this pose and refused to break out of it. Yeah, he's kind of a douche. Okay, Loki reappears to Casey. <laughs> Yeah, this show and its jump scares. Like, remember that? Ah! In addition to Loki screaming, if you go through this gummy time slip frame by frame, his arm does reach out and swipe inches away from Casey's face. So yeah, the ink ain't the only thing leaking on Casey's clothes here. Loki tries to follow present Mobius and present B-15 to the war room. Okay, they probably heard the rumors. <laughs> Yeah, they shot Owen Wilson and Wumi Mosaku in handheld, so they must have played it in Tom Hiddleston in the background, and it looks pretty good. But what terrified Casey is just kind of a background nothing to them. They run into Hunter D90, Neil Elise, who pruned Mobius last season and threatened the victims of Haven Hills in episode two. Actually ran into Neil in LA one time. He's a really nice guy. Loki finds a past war room, and it's empty, but with a wall of five faces of he who remains, each angled in a kind of spectrum so that it looks like they're all looking in different directions. score includes some subtle vocal chanting whenever we see the face of Kang, like in the opening seconds. And the corners of this room appear to be statued heads of hunters honoring the foot soldiers who must have helped Higgy Remains win his multiversal war. But in the corner of the present day war room is a female face statue, which I wonder might be for Renslayer, who sounds like ruled alongside Higgy Remains in the past before he reset her and made her a judge. But we match cut from Loki and wide in the past facing this wall to the present day war room where these Higgy Remains faces have been covered in this timekeeper mural. This episode just does a great Great job anchoring us with little visual details between the present and the past areas of the TVA to show us how it changed and suggest something about He Remains retcons and create visual expository clues to explain how time slipping alters history. We see the severed timekeeper head on the present day war room table. This was the one that Sylvie decapitated and seemed to whisper, see you soon, as it rolled on the floor of the chamber. See you soon. 
Nope. Sitting at this table are Judge Gamble and some unknown sleepy judge and General Dox and X5 sitting together. Now these two seem to have a creepy mother-son relationship that B-15 hilariously side eyes later. It reminds us of Lady Liza Aaron with her son Robin Aaron sitting on her lap in Game of Thrones. But the TVA even having a war room reminds us of Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove and it just kind of tells us that the TVA isn't just a legal or administrative entity, it's also a military operation with freaking generals. Remember, the TVA had to violently establish a sacred timeline by winning the multiversal war, and He Remains was a Kang variant who won that war. But they listened to this recording. You're all variants. Everyone who works for the TVA. The Timekeepers didn't create you, they kidnapped you from the timeline and erased your memories. Memories she can access through enchantment. So before this, you had a past. Maybe you had a family. A life. Loki actually said this back in episode four of the first season. You're all variants. Dox's uniform is awesome. It's covered in medals and ribbons. We actually see eight ribbons and they all have different faces that look somewhat like the different timekeepers, but I might be crazy. That kind of looks like a mix of Iron Man heads and Thanos heads. Or maybe these are Kang variants whose timelines she victoriously pruned for He Remains. On her necktie and on her collars are pins with similar faces, but on her shoulders are floral-esque pins that likely connote her rank. Like in the US military, we use stars on the soldiers that indicate what rank of general, like a one-star general, two-star general, three-star general. Based on this, Dox would be a three-star general, of which in the real world, we only have 146 active duty generals in the United States military. On the left side of her uniform, there is a TVA hourglass badge. But similar to the UN or G8 summit meetings, when someone speaks, they hit a button for the record, which lights their corner above their heads. We are doing this by the book and on the record. The record now has a deeper meaning to these characters. As we know, He Remains keeps a transcript of everything everyone has said and will say. Back in the past era war room, Loki plays a different recording. You are quite a marvel. I will be proud to lead with you. You made a difference in this war. Thank you for being on my team. And then Loki rewinds to play from the beginning. For us, for all time. Always. Professor Rinsley, you are quite a marvel. So much to take away here. He Remains and Renslayer once worked side by side, and she was instrumental in winning this multiversal war in which he pruned all other Kang's timelines. But then something happened for He Remains to change his mind and demote Renslayer to a judge who serves the timekeepers. And he calls her a Marvel, which can't be a coincidence with the next MCU film being called The Marvels. It seems to elevate Renslayer to the status of a multiversal warrior, someone who could play a role alongside Carol and Monica in Secret Wars. Also, for us and always could have also been the origin of the term for all time always. When Loki rewinds the recording to hear the full thing, this is actually after he walked a full loop around this triangular table and returned to the starting point. Time is a flat circle. But let's not brush past this recording even being on this tape deck here. Someone in this past era, the TVA, was listening to it in the war room and they paused it in the middle of it right after hearing the name Ravona Renslayer. I think Renslayer was here moments earlier in the past and that might be what caused this past crisis with the 63 branches Mobius and B-15 were referring to. Now it's kind of hard to tell, but the orange text on that screen with the sound wave bar across the top reads temporal audio chronometer and then lists the word timeline on the right column with three character codes for each one and then at the bottom are the words event date and vector and then the date on the screen is 6 12 23 21 now we don't know if that date was when the recording was made or when it was last listened to but the tva is supposed to be removed from time independent of any sacred timeline date but we do know that kang's original scientist identity of nathaniel richards began in the 31st century and the multiversal war could have been a future event in our historical timeline like in the 22nd century the 23rd century after which the tva was formed and that could set this listen to date as 2321. I, I don't know, I have so many questions, but I do know these details are added by designers like the folks at Cantina Creative based on interviews I've done. They're all extremely talented and creative folks who will often pitch long lists of words and phrases to put on these screens for approval by the show producers and Marvel Studios. And actually that Thanos multiple choice question in season one came out of this process from the Cantina designers. We'll get back to Loki in a moment, but first we wanna say thanks to Spin Master for sponsoring this video, as well as introduce their new brand, 4D Build, featuring licensed 3D Marvel puzzles. 4D Build makes new car stock 3D puzzle model kits. If you're a Marvel super fan who digs puzzles or wants to add to your museum of Marvel collectibles, you are gonna love these. Everything you need to build a 3D puzzle comes in the box. You're not gonna have to go hunt down like a tiny screwdriver or anything like that. Each box contains a set of cardstock puzzle sheets, instructions, and a punch tool to help get those pieces out. The instructions are super clear and easy to follow. Puzzle sheets have letters, puzzle pieces are numbered, and have colored dots to help connect them into the right places. So we got this Mjolnir, and it took us about two hours to build, which, you know, 
is less time than it took to forge. There is so much attention to detail and the puzzles are super sturdy when they're done. They are designed with replica level detail and made for showing off, which is why every model comes with a display stand. To get a 4D build Marvel puzzle model kit of your own, just click one of the links in the description below or head to Target or Amazon. For as little as $15, you can start your Marvel, Star Wars, or Harry Potter puzzle collection today. So Judge Gamble, the more rational of these new leaders, points out that D90 testified seeing Renslayer's variant in the Sacred Timeline, referring to that scene in the season one finale where B15 and D90 confirmed Renslayer was once a principal at Franklin D. Roosevelt High School in Fremont, Ohio in 2018, and her name was Rebecca Termine there. That was Renslayer's comic alias when she was with Victor Timely in 1901. I just find it interesting that Judge Gamble's personal confession of her guilt for only issuing guilty verdicts, she keeps off the record, but then she hits the on the record light when she orders to pause all pruning. Loki time slips into the present, he snatches X5's pruning stick, and he prunes the timekeeper mural wall to reveal the He Remains faces. It reminds me of Hela peeling back Asgard's ceiling in Ragnarok to show the original history that Odin had covered up. It's just interesting that He Remains didn't erase his original statue faces. He like wallpapered over them, kind of like some part of him knew that he might want to come back into the light someday. Loki recaps to Mobius the events of season one, episode five, and season one, episode six, and Hiddleston does such a good job conveying the terror here. We got to the man at the end of time. And he made sense. What scares Loki the most is that he met someone with a more accurate read on reality than he has. He actually repeats, you came to kill the devil, something he remains said to them, and Loki still doesn't know if he was a devil or he wasn't. And Loki says, I wish I'd had more time. This is something he says a few times, actually. It's something that Marty McFly says in Back to the Future when he thinks Doc is doomed. I only had more time. Wait a minute. I got all the time I want, I got a time machine. While Loki begins this season seeing time slipping as a curse, I predict at the end of the season, it'll be a power that he leans into to give himself more time to do things like, oh, I don't know, undo Sylvie's decision in the Citadel, to restore He Remains, or to at least be confronted with that decision. When Mobius asks who's coming, Loki points to this mural depicting several figures shooting lasers at each other. This is actually Kang's comic appearance. And it's just interesting that in this present Timekeeper TVA, they all had these Kangs in their art under their noses. We are seeing the multiversal war that He Remains has been referring to when all Kangs fought it out, and I actually think that that's gonna be a future war that the MCU will depict in Avengers Kang Dynasty. Loki time slips in front of Mobius, and Mobius now can't make eye contact with him. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. What is it? How does it, how does it look? It's, it looks... I mean, how does it feel? But when Loki time slips in the elevator, Mobius can't help but admit it looks horrible. It looks like you're being born or dying or both at the same time. Born and dying at the same time. Time is a flat circle. And so this condition is like both life events neutralizing each other out to extract one from reality. And we get this great camera gag. It's not that bad. I can handle it. How does it look? This is a common gag Wes Anderson loves to use, though maybe that's just with Owen Wilson being in it, but it's also something uh, directors like the Russo brothers would do, you know, to kind of like a third person is actually in the room gag in episodes of Arrested Development. Michael, you don't want to make the same mistake your mom made with Buster. What happened there? He turned out a little uh, soft, you know, a little doughy. <sighs> They pass a poster that reads, minimize chit chat in the cafeteria, please. Limit your lunch break to 17 minutes. On the various prop posters that were released ahead of the season, 17 minutes is also a time limit that the TVA automat enforces. 17, a number that's oddly specific. It's a prime number that's just kind of difficult to keep track of or schedule your workday around. To the left of that poster is another one. The timeline won't wait for seconds, which is a solid pun with the image of someone with a stack of plates on his table. Then we see them in the same hallway where Loki escaped to in the very first episode, where we saw that variant that looks like Peggy Carter. This actually leads to the orange tile wall and the check-in desk where incoming variants would check in with Casey. But then the camera zips down the hall ahead of them as Mobius questions the name he who remains. Pretty arrogant. It's like calling yourself last man standing. Yeah, it might be a nod to the Tim Allen ABC sitcom that got canceled and then moved over to Fox. Hey, Tim Allen is now making bank on Disney Plus and the Santa Clauses season two coming next month. They pass another poster, catch a nexus, prevent a timeline, and then the timeline is only as strong as its weakest link. And then a wall with quartets of pneumatic tubes, which is just so sad because at this point, people would just be so close to OB, just a quick elevator trip down to him. But still, they would rather just send the jobs through the tubes than and talk to him. The sign inside the elevator is a ton of text, but you can make out the words temporal radiation and some radiation symbols. Since this elevator seems to lead down only to OB and his office is next to the temporal loom room, he's probably one who put this up and it just sucks that he has to be so close to the radiation. Okay, there's a close up with tube canisters with secure internal on the label. There's one with a rotting banana in it and the label suggests it's from B10, maybe another hunter in B15's unit who's bullying OB. We're in repairs and advancement and there are more posters on the left, pneumatic tube etiquette, which we get a better look of in the official posters that D 
details approved usage, forbidden usage that includes sending provocative imagery with the image of a Dear John letter in the tube, and then punishable offenses, which includes live or dead animals. And then on the right is a poster of a smoking temp pad. Temperamental temp pad, don't delay, repair today. And then descending from above is Ki Hui Quan as Obi or Ouroboros, his name coming from the Egyptian mythological snake eating its own tail. Time is a flat circle. Ki Hui Quan, after being a child star from Temple of Doom in the Goonies, he had a massive comeback last year, winning an Oscar for Everything Everywhere All at Once. His jumpsuit has a patch with three gear cogs, and I just love how the wide framing lines up the tubes to feed directly into his head. Mobius doesn't remember the last time he saw Obi. Could it be three or four? Four hundred years. What? He was my last visitor. Since Loki is somewhat of a workplace comedy, Obi seems to be Stephen F. Root's Milton from Office Space, whom Lumberg relocates down to the basement. But he also has the plucky can-do energy of Mr. Meeseeks or Abed Nadir, and I just love him. In this room, there's a jar of gumballs and a large clock with multiple hands, and another poster on the left reads, mind your head, warning about getting hit in the head with tube canisters when they fall. While Obi takes one of the carbon copies and pops it on the skewer, he tosses the other two parts of the carbon copies on the counter, clearly no ordering system. And on that stack, notice the carbon copies are not any one color, so he's just kind of taking any one of the three and sticking them on there. Loki time slips into the past where OB is not wearing glasses. There's no gumball machine, but there is an old school Sprite vending machine and far fewer work tickets on the stick. We get some more Wes Anderson style rapid cutting and center framing so that our eyes don't have to move across the frame to a new face on the other side of the screen during a cut. This is a little technical trick to speed up the timing of something, which is helpful for comedic effect. Present OB tells Mobius that he can't remember time slipping happening, but then... Wait. No. There was one time. Is he talking to you in the past and you're just now remembering it? Wow. That makes perfect sense. So what we are seeing here is a memory forming in real time inside of Obi's head as Loki in the past changes his history. This idea of new memories forming is something that we've seen in the butterfly effects from the movie Arrival when Amy Adams gives her past self new knowledge by chatting with a Chinese general to learn his wife's dying words or in Lost season five when the island was unstuck from time and Charlotte begins to lose her mind as she forms new memories of a scary man in her past that actually ended up being Faraday. It's one of the craziest aspects of time travel. I love that they included it here. Past Obi says that the person in the time Loki wants to and up and needs a temporal aura extractor. Now, we first heard the term a temporal aura in season one, episode one, when Loki was being processed and a machine would scan Loki's temporal aura and make sure he wasn't a robot. Temporal aura must refer to a soul signature or source code that transcends all of time. Present Loki says that he doesn't have a temporal aura extractor, but then we pan back to past RNA and it's implied that Loki waited there for hours, maybe days, as past OB builds one. Loki tells past OB to hold onto it and now it appears by present OB's side, meaning it had been there for 400 years or some amount of time time, according to this history. Storing objects through time is also what Doc Brown does with the DeLorean from 1885 to 1955 and Back to the Future Part 3, and something the father and son do in frequency to share evidence of the murder suspect through the decades. Obi explains that they need to take the temporal aura extractor to the temporal loom to pull Loki out of the time stream, and Mobius reports, Wait, wait so I need to get to the temporal loom so the extractor can pull Loki out of the time stream? But Owen Wilson always pronounced it temporal instead of the correct temporal, which I will admit, I for many years would say temporal, like shrimp tempura, and I blame it on Owen Wilson. Wow. But Obi warns Mobius that exposure to temporal radiation will rip the skin off his body, and that Loki has to prove himself wherever he is to free himself from time. The past Obi says, Have you heard about how if you fall into a black hole, you turn into spaghetti? No. Good. The less you know about that, the better. So this may remind you of what happened to one of the Scott Lang doppelgangers in the probability storm in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Now that wasn't a black hole, but it does kind of have a singularity with similarly tricky quantum mechanics at play. The visual also feels like what Wanda Maximoff did to Reed Richards in Multiverse of Madness. So they head to the temporal loom observation deck, what I'm gonna call the loom room. Now the floor in the hallway has these follow me lines, a pale yellow one leading to the RNA room, and then a seafoam colored one leading to the loom room. They also pass a hot chocolate machine by the elevator. The floor outside the loom room reads, danger, temporal radiation levels increase exponentially beyond this threshold, likelihood of spaghettification increases 7,000% proceed with caution. The loom room door has an X with a circle in the middle, opening from the center, which our writer Gina said looks similar to the Cerebro door in X-Men, and I agree. OB says the temporal loom is where raw time is refined into physical timeline. I love this idea that time in its natural state is kind of raw and nebulous, but weaving it together into a causal history of events is an artificial construction and decision. Spaghetti is also an interesting example because this visual totally reminds me of a meat grinder making sausage. Seeing the timeline like this from the start end reminds me of the open-ended end piece that Miss Minute showed Sylvie and Renslayer back in season one, episode five. And Mobius traces skin in the dust, which is ironic because technically dust itself is primarily composed of dead human skin. Obi explains that Loki has to wait for Mobius to install the extractor in the core and that will turn the meter green, at which point Loki can prune himself. But because it's getting unstable, he's gonna have to shut the blast doors in five minutes to give himself extra time to retrofit this loom to accept more branches. So really, the stakes are set by all of these people's willingness to avoid pruning all these extra timelines and erasing countless lives. 
they are taking the more difficult path to save other people they haven't ever met. Loki time flips again, and at one point, the slipped face of Loki just pushes toward Mobius, looking faded as f Hiddleston actually had to act out all of these spasms. Having learned from the crack on the floor, Loki uses the skin tracing to know that he must be in the future now. So present Obi loads Mobius into a hilariously puffy temporal radiation suit with an insanely bulky vent running in the back. It's not just inconvenient, it's also humiliating and has the same tan and seafoam color scheme of Obi's jumpsuit. Obi warns that once the suit gives out, before his skin peels away, Mobius will get very old. Fitting for an Indiana Jones actor to reference Indiana Jones' The Last Crusade when the false grail caused Donovan to rapidly age, Obi covers the crack in the helmet with a duct tape like Mark Watney does in the Martian, which could seal it shut at least in airless space, but it wouldn't keep out radiation. As he trudges out, on the outside of the building are the words, for all time always, which tells me that someone must have built this so that someone would look at this building from the outside in. Oh, I gotta say, while the rest of Mobius's suit padding will erode due to the temporal radiation, the duct tape is the one thing that doesn't burn away. So truly it is man's greatest invention. So in the future of TVA, things have gotten even worse with the temporal loom crisis. A PA announcer says, TVA code 1127, all persons now report to your nearest time door evacuation point. But my question is, where do they evacuate to? Like, all of reality is about to explode. Do they go to the void? Is there some backup TVA? And Loki can see on this future TVA Chrono Monitor Bay screen that even more branch timelines are cramming into that loom, most of them staking off into the red zone. But it's interesting how these lines exist as dangerous branches before they even enter the loom. Because earlier, OB said that everything this side of the temporal loom was supposed to be abstract time. But I guess this traffic jam has caused some of that abstract time to actually turn into unwoven branches that should never be branches with nowhere to go but the red zone. And I do like how there's one swooping curved white line on the left through all of that that I'm just kind of wondering what's going on with that one. So Loki runs out over the future exterior walkway and you can actually see the background platforms have been updated from solo Kang statues back to being three timekeeper statues all propping up the platforms. I don't know if it's just me, but the whole vibe here, the sirens, the countdown, the radiation, OB needing to punch in a code on an old computer terminal and then punch a button, doesn't this season two premiere kind of feel like the season two premiere of lost inside the hatch with desmond a character who later becomes a similarly time displaced character the lost season two premiere totally kicked off that season with a similar breakneck pace and some bizarre crisis with a lot of weird new rules and it kind of feels like we're in a similar place with loki but loki is looking for a time stick in the vacant future tda he's now on the legal level right beside where the war room was but he's drawn now to a phone ringing we're actually reminded of neo in the matrix when he was sprinting toward an exit, drawn in by the sound of a phone ringing, and Loki and Neo both in their sprints here, getting a painful plug in the torso. But the elevator doors get pried open, and it is Sylvie! There you are. Yes, Natalie Holt's sorrowful violin music returns. This is the music that played when Loki saw the film reel footage of Frigga dying back in season one. And here, if you look closely, a teardrop trickles down Loki's cheek right as he is pruned from behind. So it is some guardian angel, knowingly or unknowingly, who delivered exactly what he needed to survive right now. But to do it, they tragically had to pull him away from the face he most wanted to see. And speaking of teardrops, when Loki bursts out of that time stream to the present, he is reflected on Mobius's helmet in a way that makes it look like a sparkle teardrop is on Mobius's cheek. His prayers have been answered too. Two doomed souls adrift in a timeless wasteland smack into each other and propel both of them to a safe haven. Isn't that the perfect metaphor for what this series is all about? Meanwhile, a team led by General Dox and X5, after raiding the armory as D90 warned about before, now marches through a time door and you can look inside their duffel bags to see they contain a whole bunch of reset charges. You know those canisters? So they're probably headed out to prune some timelines as Dox said that she wanted to earlier. But they pass an orange poster that it reads, your time cube atmosphere is enough to put you at ease. Although the gas inside the cube smells a bit noxious, be advised it is mostly non-toxic. Best to try and relax for what is coming next. But if time cube squeezed the person inside, what would be coming next? The closing title sequence actually mixes in a lot of the imagery from the season one credit sequence, but they did plug in some new shots of things from the new season and some interesting curiosities. So we start with a severed timekeeper robot head, but then shortly after this, we see some post-it notes on a wall with all kinds of weird phrases. There's a few uses of the word hex, then the truth. What does the monster represent? Hex moment. Also, the boy betrayed the tower keeper. Also, his feet silent creeping on the soft moss covered floor. Pool of deception, vapor traps and lungs initiates dream state parallax. Mortality plus grandeur, expansiveness and amplitude. Cracks appear in the fabric of reality. Continuity of ancestral pilgrimage, dark mountains. That could refer to the dark mountains that was in Loki's Asgardian song in the train in the Lament 
Atlantis episode last season. Arrangements having nearly the same energy, re-echoed sound, multiple reflections of the same sound, secret of something mountain, Yorin's betrayal, Amulet's curse, the cracking of water slash ice, her innocence, naive, keeps her safe unbeknownst to her. Then we see a slice of bright green key lime pie from the automat. Then some diagrams of the temporal loom. I think this is in the orange TVA guidebook with the printed text of monitoring and maintaining the sacred timeline. And then handwritten in cursive looks like the words throughput mallfire. Then what looks like a smaller scale version of the temporal loom, maybe a prototype of it. And then we see a bookshelf. There's a book titled Black Holes, The End of the Universe. Definitely recalling OB's warnings of spaghettification. Other titles that we can see on this bookcase include a copy of Phoenix in Obsidian by Michael Moorcock. This is a book about the representation of the eternal champion who's a hero who appears in many forms across the multiverse and he's flung from one existence to another. Michael Moorcock is one of the first people to like fictionalize the concept of the multiverse. And yeah, this eternal champion kind of sounds like what Loki's going through. Also part of this series by Michael Moorcock, we see the final program, which is about a hip spy in the 60s named Jerry Cornelius, who's another manifestation of the eternal champion, kind of a James Bond parody, but just very surreal. You can also see Solus by Atancio, which is described as a thought provoking and original exploration of what it means to be a sentient being. We see that turn dial phone that Loki saw and heard ringing. And here you can see a blinking light for the SS1 line on hold. So let's try to figure out what SS1 is. Then we see that hot coffee, hot chocolate, an ew soup machine that they passed by the elevator on the RNA level. This machine's awesome. It has options to put milk and extra marshmallows in it. And yeah, this is actually a real machine, by the way, from the 60s in Britain. Then we see a few figurines of the temporal core and someone in that suit. And I assume this is going to be part of a future episode. There's a quick shot of that Infinity Stone drawer from season one. And then this monkey toy. I actually spotted this in the very first season two teaser footage that I broke down late last year. I'm telling you, I have been tracking everything for the show for the past several years. This monkey is a vintage 50s toy from Japanese toy maker Alps. It's made of tin and felt. Batteries go into the stereo. He normally comes with a little green sombrero, but this one doesn't have it. He strums the guitar and he sways and rocks his head as his feet tap in those little orange shoes. We see file photos of moments from this episode and they always put this under the casting team, Sarah Haley Finn, because these are like headshots of these people that they had cast. We see OB, we see Judge Gamble, we see B-15's side eye moment, and then we see what she's looking at, General Docs and X-5's creepy embrace, and then Loki. And then we see the 1982 McDonald's register under Sofia Martino name. Then we see this warning post that's actually outside the loom room, and this is hilarious. Life-saving protocols. Check your suit for defects before entry. Exposure to extreme temporal energy will result in fatal corporeal dehusking. Avoid spaghettification. Then there's some orange machine that looks like it's in that orange room where Loki will put the time cube on X5 based off of trailer footage. We see he remains Tempad, just kind of sitting on his desk. Then we see this other book, The Zartan Contingent by someone named A.D. Doug, PhD, which we think this might be a fake book. And that's interesting because all the other books we saw are actually real books. And then we see the TVA official handbook, which you'll notice at the bottom reads by Ouroboros. He wrote it. Okay, we end the season two premiere with a post credit scene. 1982, Broxton, Oklahoma. Holy shit. Broxton, Oklahoma is a fun pull. This is where in the comics, after the Ragnarok event, Thor chooses the town of Broxton, Oklahoma to relocate the city of Asgard to, and he has it initially hovering over the ground by a few feet. So Broxton ends up being a very important location to the Marvel comics in that era. And I love how the title on screen specifies branched timeline. So I guess going forward, the show is going to tell us when events are set on the sacred timeline and when they're in branches. So Sylvie, this is right after killing He Remains, she enters this 1982 McDonald's. Inside, you can see this creepy vintage McDonald's land tree that locations used to have. This guy looks high as hell. They're wearing the orange uniforms that are specific to the designs worn by employees in the late 70s. Remember, this is rural Oklahoma, so they might be a bit behind the wardrobe times compared to the big cities and suburbs. Sylvie tells Jack, who's just adorable. Not squirrel, not possum, not rats, something that's already dead and nothing with a face. Please. Yeah, having been on the run through apocalyptic events for eons, she's used to having to hunt her own food. And I love how Jack first plugs the new Chicken McNuggets. I love this detail because as I pointed out in a video last summer, the Chicken McNuggets were first introduced in 1981. Just great continuity there. And Jack just goes on and on with the menu items. And Sylvie says, I want to try everything. Yeah, freaking Try Guys Keith here. But Sylvie really wants to just try everything in life. But McDonald's represents simple childhood joys that she never had growing up. And just trying everything on the McDonald's menu is really her first step to try to reclaim those simple pleasures that she was denied. So what can we expect from episode two? Well, we're gonna talk about that on Sunday because we're launching a new format called Snake Peek. And for this season of Loki, Jessica Clements is coming back. She and I are gonna team up for these weekly heat checks for Loki, looking ahead to each next episode. You can support our 
our channel by grabbing some merch available at nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. Thank you to Noah Chen for helping me write and research this breakdown. You can follow me on all social platforms at EA Boss. Follow New Rockstars. Thanks for watching and bye, y'all.